So anyway, welcome to this episode of Totally Unscripted. Um, today we've got um, uh, some bits and pieces to look at. So um, we'll start with some news and updates. And then uh, for this show, we're going to look at the new uh, Google Apps Script manifest files. Um, so this is a way to, that you can control your projects. Um, so we'll have a look at those in a second. So we'll start off with um, some bits and pieces uh, to come out. So in terms of news, I think the biggest piece of news to come out uh, since our last show is that um, Gmail add-ons, um, which are powered by Google Apps Script, they're now um, out of preview and anyone can uh, start developing code for those. Um, so there's documentation uh, available on, on the website. Um, I think Google being very selective about which add-ons get published. Um, so um, there may be a delay if you are keen to um, do something. Um, there might be a longer wait than you would have for um, uh, publishing add-ons and getting those through review. Uh, release notes. So um, add-ons is part of the release notes. Uh, related to that is card service, which is part of Gmail add-ons. And um, in the past, we've speculated whether or not this type of um, UI design is going to be rolled up out across other add-ons for sheets, docs, forms, and slides. Um, nothing has been said of that. So, and I think uh, the existing HTML service um, will certainly be around for quite a while yet, if not forever. Um, Manifest, so we're going to talk about that later. Roll-off scopes, which is related uh, to Manifest for game, we'll talk about. Um, deploying scripts, again, this is related uh, in part to Manifests. Uh, and there's um, been some updates as well to the, um, the script editor. Um, so in terms of what, what's going on in the community, well, uh, the first one actually comes from Alan, too, and it's related to this. So. It's the additions that we've got in the, in the script editor. So uh, in terms of how add-ons are tested, um, showing the manifest and deploying from the manifest. Um, so um, interesting to see that you know the, the editor is in uh, continual development. Um, so some new add-ons for education from uh, Steve Webster highlighted these. Um, so um, there's a, a, the link there, and we'll share the slide so you can um, check those out. Um, Eric Kalida, who's part of the Google Developer Relations team, um, he highlighted a, a, a new add-on from uh, Anna Agra, um, so uh, which is a, another one of these merge type um, add-ons. Um, so it looks quite nice. It's um, a bit like yet another mail merge, but uh, more document focused. So, uh, but it does have an email option. So it might be something you look at as an alternative to yet another mail merge. Um, so, uh, Kanchi um, has um, updated uh, GGS run. This is a, a command line interface. So a couple of command line interfaces now. I've seen published. So this allows you to um, um, write and deploy um, code um, from the script editor. So um, from uh, sorry, from a, a command line. So um, Kanchi's updated his command line tool to include the manifest files, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Kanchi is probably uh, one of my favorite GitHub um, users to follow right now in terms of the amount of stuff that he's developing. And um, we'll pick up some of that at the end of this year as well. Um, so the next one is quite a big one. So there was, it's been quite hard to piece this together. There was some changes pushed by Google, which included a, a new scope for a script container UI. Uh, and this has created quite a few headaches for different people in terms of add-on developers, add-on users, uh, even um, people publishing scripts that are container-bound. So 
there was a security, an unspecified security issue, which Google had to patch quickly, related in some way to the UI. Um, so uh, modal dialogue sidebars. Uh, so some changes that Steve spotted in terms of the review process. Um, so uh, originally, uh, Google said that um, existing add-ons didn't need to go through the verification process, and now they've notified developers that they need to do that before um, the end of December. Um, there was also um, something Steve highlighted in terms of if you republish an add-on, um, there's a chance it, it doesn't get automatically approved. So previously, when you pushed up um, that update, hit your users, but um, uh, there might there is a chance that Google will do a manual review of your code if you if you do an update. Um, so uh, something to be aware of. Um, so Barry Roberts has been doing a, a tutorial series for AppScript. So if you've got friends or colleagues that uh, you think should be starting app scripting and perhaps they need a starting point. Um, Barry Roberts has got a, a series. Uh, so he, I think it's actually up to number 16 now in terms of uh, tutorials. So um, nice resource for the community to have. Um, I mentioned Kanchi. So another, um, uh, well, I think this is, I don't think he's published it as an add-on, but you can check it out from the post. So this just allows you to rearrange the, the script order. So in the script editor, um, so um, the options currently are to sort it alphabetically or in the order that you created your scripts. So this is a, a nice little UI that allows you to re rearrange it. I think the feedback Kanchi got is to uh, publish this as a, um, a web app uh, in the Chrome extensions store. Um, so you, you may do that. Um, something not directly um, app script related, but there's quite a few people I know that use the Atom um, text slash code editor for development. So um, a nice update. This is a, um, a, a desktop application. So it works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. So unfortunately, if you've got a Chromebook, it, it won't work with that unless you're VMing. Um, you've got a VM that you're running somewhere. Um, but uh, they've announced that they've got a real-time collaboration uh, add-on to that now. Um, the nice thing about it is it's a peer-to-peer -peer encrypted in, uh, connection, so it's not running via server. Um, so um, I haven't looked in detail about how many people can simultaneously edit. Um, but it looks like a nice add-on. Um, because it's um, an offline editor, you're not going to get the app script all complete. Um, but I know a lot of people um, do a lot of offline script editing anyway. So it might be a, uh, something that you're interested in looking at. So uh, the app script manifest files. Um, so it's just a, a JSON file. It's actually in every um, script project. So either container bound or standalone, it's, it's, it's always there. By default, it's actually hidden. So um, to view it um, from the script editor, you can go view uh, show manifest file. Um, if you're doing something with a command line tool or working offline, um, if it's a standalone script, it's accessible. Uh, through the Drive API as well. So if you want to get access to it, it's just a, a JSON file and it um, just records um, some settings for the, the script project that you're working on. Um, so uh, one of the recommendations actually we will make is uh, that um, it's not recommended to have your uh, manifest file visible for other people. So that their suggestion is to, to hide it immediately. Um, obvious how to um, hide your manifest file. 
um, but it's basically unticking it from the script editor, editor view menu. So what's actually in the manifest file? What, what can you do within your project setting? So I'll go through uh, the kind of headlines here. So one of the things you can do is the time zones. So you can actually set the script time zone. Um, so this can be useful if you're um, using, for example, a clock trigger um, to set at the, the correct time. Um, so the, in terms of the time zone uh, string, it, it, it's a zone ID, which I think is a, a Java thing. There's a link to it so you can um, see uh, which zone IDs. Um, you can also set this from the, the script editor um, menu as well. Things that often catches people out is if you've got a container brand script, um, the time zone can be set in the spreadsheet and the script um, or, the, or the doc where you've bound your script to. Um, so that can cause confusion because um, you can have different time zones, one for the script, one for what, whatever the container bound application has. Um, I think one of the biggest things within um, the manifest files is um, scopes. So for a number of years, there's been quite a bit of feedback about the scopes. So these are uh, the permission levels that your scripts run. Um, so um, these have historically been very broad. So if you, for example, uh, include something like spreadsheet app uh, within your uh, script project, then uh, the permissions are quite broad. What the scopes side of this let's actually control. So here we've got an example with the, um, the slides app. So um, if you include slides app in your uh, script project, when you do the uh, or the user to go through your authentication flow, it's uh, they'll be prompted um, uh, with notification that um, the script will view and manage your slide presentation. So if you click on the information button, you can see it's quite broad. So create new presentations, view and modify existing presentations, and share presentations with others. One option we had um, uh, is to use the uh, only current document. Um, markup so that would restrict it to the application that the script was bound to and um, so that narrowed uh, the, the scope slightly. Within the manifest file we can actually uh, tighten this even more so uh, for example if you just want to read data uh, within your application um, you, you can specify that uh, in uh, the URL of scopes so you can actually have uh, multiple uh, scopes in here. It doesn't just have the single one that's uh, array value. So in this case, we're saying presentation read only. So uh, with this one, it's, um, the, it's part of the authentication flow. The user will be prompted um, that the script wants to view your slide presentation. So um, here it's it's more limited than, than uh, um, uh, write, so it's just read, not read and write. Um, so trying this out, um, I thought I'd give it a go with slides up. And um, uh, so I set the scope with um, uh, read only, and I actually got an error message. So um, the error I got was uh, shown here is you, you don't have get active presentations. So um, I, I don't. For me, this this was un unexpected behavior. Um, so I've actually raised this as an issue ticket. It. Um, so for me, uh, you know, getting the active presentation shouldn't have require uh, a right um, scope. Um, looking at the actual slides advanced service um, instead of app service, um, the code actually works. Um, so um, you can set the scope of read only and, and just read the data and get that um, the prompt to the user. Um, so currently something to be aware of um, if you're using a limited scope within the, the G Suite core services um, like spreadsheets, docs, and, and slides app. 
Um, as I mentioned, um, you can, uh, we, we already had uh, only current doc as a way to limit the scope. So um, this was included in the document as a, um, a comment and this was parsed and detected. Um, you can include these as um, scopes in your manifest if you want. So um, the current, the doc current only works for um, across the different products. Um, so um, it, it, it's, it's no different. So it, it can perhaps be just how you prefer um, to uh, manage your projects. Is that a per function directive? Uh, that would be for the entire script project. Um, okay. so, so you only need it once. Yeah. One of the advantages of using only current document is it avoids needing to go through that verification process. Um, so this was something I needed to implement on one of my projects, which is a, uh, a spreadsheet and it has a container bound script to it. So um, because people are making a copy of that project each time, it, it's impractical to actually go through verification because when a copy is made of that project, um, basically the, the user would need to go through the verification pro process themselves. Because of what the script was doing, it was only needing to access the current um, document. Um, so by included, including that in the, in the, the, the script editor, it avoids the app verification warning. So just the, the normal authentic, um, authentication flow. Um, so that can be useful if you're having app verification headaches. Um, obviously, it's limited in terms of the scenario of what, you, what you're trying to do. Um, so in my case, I had to modify my code slightly because it was uh, wanting to read a template from a, another spreadsheet. Uh, and that wasn't permitted with the only current doc um, scope. Um, so the way around it for me was to actually have these templates hidden in the, the copy the user take, took and then use script to hide or um, uh, show uh, these templates as needed. Yeah, that's smart. It's pretty useful too. Less friction for the user. So one of the other things that is quite handy is that um, when you're um, using other Google services that are not part of um, uh, kind of the, the core offering in, in app script, um, you can actually include uh, the scope in, in the manifest. And what that means is that when the user comes to authentication, they're getting uh, the, the authentication prompt in, in, at the same time as the other uh, prompts that they're getting. So um, hopefully you just saw on the slides there, the flow showing, uh, in this case, managing photos. Um, so uh, um, Remain has uh, a number of um, libraries that allow you to access Firebase and Picasa. Uh, and so what he's done is he's updated the, the manifest within those libraries um, so that the, the authentication is included as part of that. So um, is a lot smoother in terms of you're not asking people to authenticate once against your script. And then when you include the library, uh, you, you need to do a separate authentication. It's all in one. Um, the key thing to note here, this is just for Google products. So if you're authenticating um, against something like Twitter or another service, um, you're still going to um, have to do a, a kind of two-step authentication flow. Um, so, um, when you're including, um, uh, scopes in a, in a library, uh, and, and the script project uses that library, those new scopes are, are detected and automatically added to your project, um, which is great. So you, you, you don't need to worry about those. Um, there is a scenario though, if you're, um, creating your own script project, it's using the library and you want to specify your own OAuth um, scopes um, as part of your project, um, this, uh, you should include the OAuth scopes that were included in the library. So you can um, see which scopes are required as part of the project through the file project properties in the scopes tab. So 
in this top image, you can see I've imported the Picasa app library. These are all the scopes that it needs to run. So if I'm want, wanting to add additional scopes um, to my project uh, through the manifest file, I need to include those um, as well as any other ones I want to specify. If you don't need to specify or don't want to specify a manifest file, uh, leaving OAuth scopes blank is perfectly fine. An app script will just de automatically detect what scopes it needs and then prompt the user for it. Um, so um, something just to be aware of. Um, so I think the, the basic advice is um, if you're using libraries and you're not bothering uh, to add additional scopes for, through the manifest file, um, there's nothing to worry about. It's only if you are doing something in the manifest file to specify additional scopes um, that you need to be uh, careful. So another feature of the manifest file is the option to for, for you to specify um, whitelisting URLs. So this is in association with URL fetch app. So uh, for example, uh, one of my projects is using the Twitter API. So uh, as, as part of the, the um, manifest, you can specify that your, your script is only going to else. Um, something to note is there's a couple of things here. So um, when I was running tests, um, when I included a, a whitelist URLs in the manifest files, for the end user, it's not displayed. So they don't know that you've, you've limited your uh, URL fetch calls to a, um, a set of URLs. Um, so to them, it, it's, uh, there, there's no difference. This may change in the future. Um, I don't know. Um, the other thing I discovered, so in the previous example uh, where um, OAuth scopes were defined in a library file, uh, and automatically detected in your script project that was using that library, uh, whitelisting isn't automatically detected. So if a library is specifying uh, a URL fetch whitelist, um, it, it's not automatically pulled into the, the script project using that library. Um, so it's only if the script project itself specifies a URL fetch um, whitelist that it's actually used. Um, and the image at the bottom actually shows the, the error message that users will see or, or, or will be thrown. Um, so it'll, it'll say uh, the reason that you can't hit something if, you're, if you've specified a URL fetch um, list um, is because it's not in the script manifest, which may cause some head scratching from the end user as they start wondering what's a, what's a script manifest. So you may get um, support requests around that. I'm guessing uh, URL fetch whitelisting is going to be more used by Google for their in internal app verification process. Um, so it, it, it might just lead to a quicker green light in terms of your application being verified, or it might be something that they specify um, as part of the app verification process. Um, so in terms of the URL format, um, there are a couple of requirements. I think one of the big ones is that there's no wildcard usage in here. So you can, uh, you can specify um, a prefix um, and then URL fetch will basically allow anything that has that prefix in URL um, up, up to um, uh, the path. Um, but it, it does, you know, if you've got something on, on different subdomains, then you need to sp specify those different subdomains in each of the. Uh, the other thing is all the whitelisting URLs um, need to be HTTPS, so over a secure connection. Um, so dependencies, so. Um, 
as part of the dependencies, um, advanced services and, and libraries are included. Um, so in this example, um, you can see how the data is laid out. So at the top, we've got an enabled advanced service of um, sheets, and it's um, specifying a user symbol, a service ID, and the version. And in the script project, um, it also has a, a library of the Kesset app. Um, when you're adding advanced services and libraries, the manifest file um, is automatically updated. Um, so you don't need to worry about specifying these in the manifest file um, for them to work. Um, that the existing process still still runs quite happily and smoothly. On enabled advanced services, um, there's an advanced service in a, another um, script project, um, but you can't set up the API console um, for it. Um, so um, I think that will probably change. Uh, it seems that uh, the manifest files are, are version one, and I think there's more to come in terms of um, app script deployment um, where we might be using uh, enabled event services and hooking it into uh, a console project. Um, Libraries um, are slightly different because um, there, there's generally no console project set up, um, although that may depend on the library. Um, so there are options there of actually um, specifying um, libraries in script projects and doing things like updating the, the version number of, of that library, which I think is going to be the most useful feature. Uh, and I've got an example in a second that we'll, we'll go through that. Um, so web app and execution API. So um, as Alan uh, discovered as part of the community spotlight stuff, um, there's a new um, uh, option within the script editor to deploy from a manifest file. Um, so this allows you to deploy web app and execution API. So um, within the manifest file, again, these are um, automatically written when you when you use the deploy uh, menu option. So it will detect if you what what setting you you've got in terms of access and execute. Um, there, it used to be that you could through script deploy a web app. Um, that's still not uh, possible even with the manifest file. So basically all you're doing for the manifest file is there's an option to see and edit who has access and who, uh, in the case of web app, uh, that, that web app executes as. Um, so I think, again, this is going to be an area where there's potentially going to be um, more available and achievable in terms of what you can do, but it's not currently there. Um, Gmail, so uh, this is where um, we, we start seeing reference to a manifest file. Um, so this is related to the add-on uh, and there's um, a whole host of different things that you specify and are, are required for Gmail add-ons in the manifest file. Um, so I don't know, again, if this is an indication of the future in, in terms of how other add-ons are developed for uh, sheets, docs, forms, and slides, um, whether this model is reused uh, as part of that. But um, um, this is entirely speculation, So, but uh, there's so much stuff um, of part of Gmail, I'm not going to cover it as part of the show, but we might come back to it as um, another show. Um, but the documentation's online if you want to have a look at it. So um, I thought I'd just so in terms of what's achievable or what's useful within manifest files, I think specifying scope is is one of the big things. The other thing was um, I mentioned uh, around libraries. So 
um, manifest app isn't a, a Google uh, app script service. It's uh, another project developed by um, Kanchi. So um, basically, this allows you to uh, work with uh, manifest files from um, standalone script files. Using setting up his manifest app, um, you can get uh, you can basically update uh, the you know the library version that uh, uh, another script project that you have access to is using. Um, so it's I just want to quickly uh, show you how that works in practice. Here I've got. Um, a script project and I've just set this up. So currently if we look in the libraries here, um, it's just got the manifest app. I'm, the only reason you're seeing manifest app here is because I'm using the same script project um, to change things around that also has manifest app in it. So when you're specifying a, uh, the project ID, it, it can be any app script project that you, you have um, edit access to. Um, so this means, you know, if you have a, a list of app script projects that you've deployed to clients, potentially there's a way for you to to access uh, the manifest for, for each of those script projects and, and do something. So the first function here is just going to, um, it's going to add the, the Picasa app. Um, so here's just the, um, the kind of the shorthand um the version of, of how it's um referenced in your script this is just the uh the, the script id so as you would add a script um to through the libraries dialog and this is the version number so um if i click run this just to Out. So now when I go into the libraries, we can see that the CASA app has been added and it's got the version number and the, the identifier as we require. Um, so say for example, you know, you've, you're distributing code as part of the library. You uh, update uh, the version and um, script projects they're using. Um, uh, which are using that library, um, we can do that again. So again, we're, we're just getting the manifest. We're seeing if the Picasa app library exists, um, and if it does, uh, uninstall it, and then install it with the new version. So we're going to move from version 13 to, to version 20, 22 on this. So if I run this code, libraries we'll see it's updated to 22 um, and you can remove stuff as well um, so I think that's quite hand handy if you know if you're developing um, scripts um, and distributing them it, it, it's essentially a handy handy way of um, updating the library versions I know people do work around with using the uh, developer modes so that um, of the you know, scripts that you've developed and distributed um, get the latest code, but this gives you a bit more control about which which version you're using. So it still allows you to do some testing within the same script project. Let's create the library um, before pushing it out. Um, so pretty much it in terms of um, what I wanted to highlight in terms of manifest files um, so as i say i think it's a work in progress from google i think it's interesting to see what is there already um, i think it's limited in the functionality that's useful for developers um, but it, it looks like a, a lot of opportunity hopefully that's yeah, been useful all questions are i'm happy to take those now or any, anything else people want to raise
Well, I guess if the floor is open, um, the Gmail add-ons, you know, n just noting, you know, they're they're different in in that they use cards, yeah. and so they work on mobile and and not not restricted to desktop. Uh, along those lines, what about um, the rest of the add-ons? Uh, will we ever see those working in, like, say, the Sheets version, uh, the Sheets app that runs on iOS mm -hmm. or Android? I so I we, we did have um, Android add-ons, and I think that was a complete botch. I've looked at those and the integration within the the mobile products is it's just not there and so i think the model that google have got for gmail add-ons i think does create interesting opportunities for um the other products so you know for documents and sheets in terms of integrating an add-on into a mobile um, version um so it'll be interesting to see if google would go will go down that line i think given the investment uh, the community has made in developing add-ons with the HTML service. I don't see them removing HTML service. Um, so if Google do go down that route, and the big um, word there is if there's been no indication that they will, then um, I think the best route would be to keep H HTML service as an option, but also have a you know a similar sort of card service. Um, available to developers if, if they want to also you know develop stuff um, that integrates within the, the mobile um, offerings within Drive. Um, but um, I think we got to wait and see on that one. And with regard to um, that uh, manifest manipulation there on included libraries, uh, what what about like like I try not to use libraries for my. Mm -hmm for my add-ons, uh, but they're all domain restricted anyway. And I know that the guidelines, at least at one point in time, said you should avoid libraries for performance reasons. Yeah. And are, 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 um, uh, is that still the case? Or as far as, as far as using outside libraries, I might like to try playing around with them a little more, but I, I kind yeah. of just a little old school. I like to know the code. So it's, it's interesting. So it's something, I've talked with Bruce McPherson um, before with uh, about so as a chain is as you say not to use libraries um, within your add-ons, but Bruce has published a number of add-ons that do use libraries, and he's also tested the performance, and he says there's no difference. Um, so um, I, it, I think that. Kind of puts a you know a bit of a gray area in terms of you know I, I i suppose at the end of the day the the advice we should follow is the the, the advice and the documentation um but it's interesting to know that uh, that is guidance and um it, it doesn't it's not it means that you know if you really do want to use that uh, libraries in your add-ons uh, other people have successfully successfully done that i think that's a perhaps a, a good time particularly as i've gone to old school webcam um to um end the show today um so um thanks for really now for uh, popping by and keeping your company and um hopefully that was useful to you all uh, so until next time goodbye cheers Thank you.